Welcome to the Nonprofit with Eric. Since 2010, it's a new radio show in the nonprofit sector dedicated to helping your charity succeed. It's no secret that combining online and offline techniques is the key to fundraising success, and practical nonprofit management advice is what you need. The Nonprofit Coach with Ted Hart is the perfect landing point to learn from top experts around the world who provide advice you can use. Ted Hart is without a doubt one of the foremost nonprofit thought leaders. Also a successful author, his books range from successful online fundraising to expert nonprofit management. Guests on the Nonprofit Coach are leaders in their field who share their insider tips and trade secrets in a conversational style both the experienced and novice will benefit from. Ted lectures around the world, but now he's here for you. From the latest in charity news, technology, fundraising, and social networking, Ted and his guests help you and your organization move to greater levels of efficiency and fundraising success. This is a live call-in show. Add your voice by calling 347-324-3080. After the show, you can find all our podcasts at tedhart.com. Click on the radio links. Don't forget to dial 347-324-3080. Now, welcome the host of the Nonprofit Coach, Ted Hart. And welcome here to the latest edition of the Nonprofit Coach. Um, our topic today is Zen and the Art of Fundraising. Uh, when we get to our page two expert, uh, as the announcer mentioned, this is a call in show, so please call in with your questions. Uh, you can call 347 324 3080. You also can email me at tedhart at tedhart.com. And uh, we are also live casting over at Facebook, so you can find us there at facebook.com forward slash Ted Hart. Uh, as always here on the Nonprofit Coach, we start with page one news. And first up here on page one news, Ashley Gatewood is joining us. Uh, Ashley is the communications and marketing manager over at CFRE International. Uh, and uh, Ashley, welcome here to the Nonprofit Coach. Hi, Ted. Thanks for having me. Great to have you back here on the show. Please bring us up to date on everything CFRE.org. Sure. Well, our next big deadline is July 15th, so that's the next application deadline for anyone listening who's had their application uh, coming along and might just need a little bit of a push to submit. That will be the uh, date to keep in mind. Share with our exactly for success that doesn't get back to you information. Oh, well, that's right. So, step by step, uh, yeah. uh, online assistant. Exactly, exactly. And uh, the webinar, the recording is 70 minutes. We really get to one of the new questions that have on their mind. That's terrific. Well, we will uh, post the link uh, to that over at uh, uh, facebook.com forward slash Ted Hart. Uh, where everyone can find that link along with our live cast today. Excellent. That would be wonderful. We also have for your international audience some news that might be of interest. We're going to have a webinar on becoming a CFRE on May 30th. There's one for 
the New Zealand audience, so the Kiwi fundraisers, a webinar just for them and about the unique challenges of fundraising in New Zealand and how CFRA can help. And on that same day, we will also have a webinar for fundraising professionals working in Austria and Germany. Oh, so we'll continue to add different countries as the year progresses, but we recognize that fundraisers have different needs, CFRA re can represent different uh, things for folks, you know, why they, they go after it. So we'll be tailoring these presentations to specific parts of the world. Okay, terrific. And all of those will be available on the YouTube channel? Yes. Terrific. All of the recordings will be available there. Um, all of our webinars are free, and there is more information on the CFRE.org homepage if you'd like to register for either one of those. Terrific, terrific. Well, we have posted that, um, as I said, over at facebook.com forward slash Ted Hart. Um, what else is new at CFRE? Well, the last piece of news that I have for today is around we'll be exhibiting at a couple of conferences coming up. Obviously, summer is a really busy conference time for all of us. And next month, we will be at the Brazil Fundraising Festival. And then in July, we will be at the Institute of Fundraising in London. And then in mid-July, we will be at the Virginia Fundraising Institute um, conference in Richmond. And we'll be, I'll keep your listeners up to date throughout uh, the year about the different conferences that we'll be at. So they're welcome to stop by our booth and ask us any questions in person. And we love to say hi to current CFREs too. Absolutely. It's a good uh, way to catch up and to ask those questions that you've always wanted to, uh, to ask about uh, CFRE is to uh, uh, be there live at, uh, at these conferences. Ashley, uh, thank you for the, uh, the update. And as you mentioned, you'll be back uh, with us in the fall. This is the uh, final show today of the Nonprofit Coach Live uh, until we come back after the, uh, the summer break on uh, September 18th is when the show will be returning live. But of course, all of the uh, shows of the Nonprofit Coach are always available uh, at tedhart.com, always available free. And uh, this is brand new, um, so Ash, I'll share this with you. Uh, if you have uh, Alexa at home, if you have the Amazon Echo uh, at home, uh, you can simply say, Echo, play Nonprofit Coach on TuneIn. Uh, and you will be able to uh, play at home all of the programs of the Nonprofit Coach, and it will start with the most recent show. Uh, so uh, anyone who wants to uh, listen to us live on Alexa can now do so. So Ashley Gatewood, thank you again for being our guest here on uh, the Nonprofit Coach. Uh, next up here on page one news is uh, Jen Bokoff. Uh, Jen uh, comes to us again uh, here on the Nonprofit Coach. Jen, thank you so much for uh, being our guest uh, here again. Uh, please uh, bring us up to date on everything new at the Foundation Center. Hey Ted, it's great to be back. Um, so I have a couple of updates from both the nonprofit side of the shop and the side that works more with foundations. But to start, I'll share our most exciting news, which is that we just relaunched, like last week, grantspace.org. So it's really beautiful. Um, that's the site that makes it really easy to find trainings and foundation center partner libraries in your region. Um, and most of the stuff on the site is free. We certainly offer some fee-based trainings, but we also have um, three free monthly webinars and so many articles to learn from and build your skill set. So it's, it's a really good home for anyone in the nonprofit sector to start. And our, our all-star librarian, Sandy Pond, who actually runs Grant Space, was just named one of 2018's 50 Movers and Shakers by Library Journal. So we're super proud of her, and I thought that that would be fun to share on your show. Absolutely. So that's announcement number one. Well, please uh, congratulate yeah. her for us. And, of course, I'm uh, posting over at facebook.com forward slash Ted Hart uh, the link to grantspace.org. Excellent. Um, so moving over to our funder side of the shop, um, we've actually had a lot of stuff going on with GrantCraft, which is the platform that I oversee. And for those of you not familiar, it's a free platform for funders to share their wisdom and perspectives so that we can all learn 
from each other and strengthen practice. So we actually launched three things last month. Um, two were what I call leadership series papers. So those are authored by field leaders who are known for thought leadership in a certain area and will publish a piece by them with the idea that it leads to conversation. So what I, the reason I wanted to publish two at the same time this past month is that both papers really encourage funders to rethink their relationships with grantees and partners and each other and how you can foster greater inclusivity and shifting power to those who lack it. So those two papers, um, one is authored by Barbara Chow at the Heising Simons Foundation, um, and her paper is called From Words to Action, A Practical Philanthropic Guide to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And then the second um, paper is by Jenny Hodgson of the Global Fund for Community Foundations and Anna Pond, who's a philanthropy consultant. And their paper is called How Community Philanthropy Shifts Power, What Donors Can Do to Help Make That Happen. Um, so those were the two leadership series papers. And then we also published um, just a few weeks later a grant craft guide, which many of your listeners probably know as, you know, the state grant craft does. We do a lot of research over a year or even more and then you know synthesize learning and put it out as really like a staple of knowledge for the field and so this guide is called open for good knowledge sharing to strengthen grant making and it explores how funders can open up and share their knowledge with the rest of the sector and there's a particular focus in this guide on evaluative knowledge because so often that's what funders say they want to know but so rarely are they actually sharing it. So there's quite a disconnect there and it plays into um, our broader Open for Good campaign that we launched last year. Terrific. So those are three big things that Brandcraft has been up to. I can share the links um, with you, Ted, if you don't have them. I but, do have the links um, over at facebook.com uh, uh, forward slash Ted Hart. I think the only one that I missed uh, was uh, Miss Chow's. What was the name of her? Uh, paper again? Yeah, the name of her paper is From Words to Action, a Practical Philanthropic Guide to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Okay, just want um, to find... And you can okay. find all of those papers on the GrantCraft homepage as well, which is just grantcraft.org. Terrific. We have all of your links um, now uh, posted over <laughs> at facebook.com forward slash Ted Hart. You can find all the links that Jen has uh, shared uh, today. Uh, so, Jen, what else is new over at Foundation Center? Let's see. I will share two more quick things. Um, one is that earlier this year, we launched our first ever um, five-year trend analysis on human rights funding. And so this has been a long time coming. We've worked with the Human Rights Funders Network um, since 2010 to begin tracking who's funding what and where in mm -hmm. human rights. And we've published that data on an annual basis, but never have we had um, this set until now to be able to look back, you know, for five years and actually draw conclusions. And there's some really interesting stuff that we learned. Um, maybe the top finding would be interesting for our that um, we saw a 45% increase in between um, 11 and 2015, which was from 1.4 billion to more than 2 billion. So that's a pretty significant shift. And when you actually drill into the data, um, which we do in our analysis, it's pretty interesting how that's happening and where it's happening. Okay. Um, and then after we launched that research, we also um, partnered on a blog series with the Human Rights Funders Network. So that's really interesting to read. and. I know for me it sparked um, a lot of excitement, but also some drive to push us in the areas where we haven't excelled, like funding people with disabilities. So I would encourage them, whether you're a funder or someone working in the human rights space, you know, to take a look at that data okay. and think about what you can learn from it. And what I posted uh, um, over on uh, Facebook.com yeah. uh, forward slash uh, Ted Hart is the link link to the entire human rights issues area um, so that folks can go directly there and see you know all the tremendous research and the blog posts uh, some uh, video blogs as well that you've done uh, in this area excellent 
And then the one last thing I'll mention, um, especially for your, your international audience, is that my colleague Lauren Bradford, who runs our global partnerships, and I will be at the European Foundation Center conference um, next week in Belgium. So if you are planning to be there and you'd like to meet up, we would love to meet up with you. So just shoot me an email or a tweet, and uh, we'll hope to bump into you there. That's terrific. Well, Jen Bokoff, thank you again for being our guest uh, here on uh, The Nonprofit Coach. Always a lot going on at the Foundation Center, and we really, truly appreciate it when you come on uh, here and uh, bring us up to speed. Have a wonderful summer. We look forward to uh, having you back after our hiatus. Uh, we'll be back uh, mid-September. Uh, until then, everybody can find the wonderful updates from the Foundation Center uh, right here at tedhart.com. Jen Bokoff, thank you for being our our guest. Thanks, Ted. Take care. We are now ready for uh, page two. I'm going to run out over to page two, and uh, first up is going to be uh, Steve Nill, who is going to do the official uh, introduction of our terrific page two expert today. <laughs> Steve Nell, of course, has been a guest here on The Nonprofit Coach many times uh, and is the founder and CEO of CharityChannel.com and Charity Channel Press. Uh, Steve Nell, thank you uh, for joining us today, and you have uh, uh, the wonderful honor of introducing uh, both our Page 2 expert today and the uh, fantastic book uh, that uh, she has written. So, uh, Steve Nell. Ted, it's an honor to, to be on your uh, program again. Thank you. And, and particularly to introduce Alexandra Pia Brovi. Uh, she goes by Alex. Um, she is sort of a gift planner's gift planner. Um, she is currently and has been for pretty much a decade the Senior Director of Gift Planning at Northwell Health Foundation. Um, she heads up a, a team that supports 23 hospitals. Um, and. Uh, you know, she, um, she, she has clearly, she is clearly a master in, in gift planning, you know, the technical aspects um, with her background and training. She has an LLM in estate planning, of course, a law degree. She, she's been a lawyer for 25 years uh, before the current, her current work um, in gift planning on behalf of the hospital chain. But the most interesting thing about Alex isn't that she's technically proficient is that I think she she's opened up a whole new way of looking at fundraisers that not fundraising but fund raisers by focusing on the attributes of excellence in um, that should be that can be achieved um, by professional fundraisers if they take the time to know what they are and to you know work toward those and so she wrote this really amazing book, um, which I fell in love with from the minute she proposed it, and of course now that it's out, I'm even more so, called Zen and the Art of Fundraising, Eight Pillars of Success. And it's a, it's a, it's a little book, it's I'm not even sure it's 100 pages. Um, I am personally still working on the first pillar, because I think what she's done is she set, she set me on a course to grow as a person. Um, and as a fundraiser myself. And the first pillar being being in the moment. So that's something that's always been hard for me. I'm always very goal oriented, gotta get stuff done and then move on to the next goal. And I very rarely stop to even enjoy the goal achievement, much less the process. So I've been working on enjoying the process thanks to Alex and her little book, Zen and the Art of Fundraising. So, um, and as if all that's not enough, she is a, uh, She's earned a black belt in Shotokan Karate, so um, she's no she's no one to be trifled with. <laughs> right. So she knows from from where Zen comes. With. Yeah. Uh, well, Alex is live here with us. If you want to say hello to uh, to Alex and uh, welcome here to the nonprofit coach, uh, Alex Brovi. Well, thanks, Ted. Um, 
Thank you. Thanks so much, Steve, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Ted. I'm, I'm honored to be on today. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, so, Steve, we're going to put you back in the green room and uh, enjoy our time here uh, with uh, our page two expert. Now, Alex, I just want to start off, if, if you don't mind, because, of course, the whole concept of Zen uh, is something that I think a lot of people have heard of, uh, as Steve just mentioned, whether or not we can actually live that. Uh, but you start your book off with a Zen proverb. So I'm going to ask you to start off by uh, helping us understand knowledge is learning something every day. Wisdom is letting go of something each day. Zen proverb. Uh, help us understand why that proverb, why start your book that way, and how does that connect to a book that has been written primarily for and about fundraisers? Sure. So that's a big chart, but I will give it the best chart that I can. So I, as you'll, you'll notice if you've leafed through the book or read the book, I have decided to use quotes. Um, throughout the book, and it's something I've done in my professional fundraising career, especially for the last 10 years, because I believe they open up a door to understanding. And so this particular quote, which is a Zen proverb, is basically a restatement of our Americanized phrase, don't sweat the small stuff. Okay. But, it, but it goes beyond that. So I have a donor who I met with yesterday who is turning 100 years old um, early next month in about two and a half weeks and as I sat there being in the moment with him yesterday for the very short period of time I will ever spend with this particular wonderful person I was really enjoying being in the moment and I thought my gosh how much wisdom does this person have that they could impart and share and part of being wise is knowing when to let things go it's it's almost the lesson of we learn at a young age when to speak and we learn when to sit back. Mm -hmm. But at 100 years old, just about 100 years mm -hmm. old, this particular person filed a brief at midnight last week. So he's still working on his knowledge and he's still sharing his wisdom. And if I can't look up to this person and say, boy, do I have a long way to go, I don't know who else to look up to. Well, that is certainly a, a good wisdom um, and ties in nicely to this this concept of Zen. Um, I have to ask you about your black belt. Um, so uh, how did you come to want to pursue that? That's an amazing accomplishment for anyone. Um, and how does that make you a better fundraiser? Oh, so that's an interesting question. So, you know, we probably all individually have bucket lists of things that we want to do. And in my 30s, I decided that I'd like to try to get a, a black belt in some type of, whether it was karate or there are a number of martial arts. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do it because I, it would be, it, it would offer numerous positive things. Not only would I be physically active, but you're also mentally active. You, you learn how to think. You learn how to react without thinking. It's something your body just picks up over time. Um, and I learned a couple of words of Japanese here and there. I, okay. I'm nowhere near fluent. I just know a couple of commands in Japanese. Okay. And I realized, that, like studying anything, I don't think most fundraisers ever necessarily, at least at my age, set out to be fundraisers. So we never really studied to be fundraisers. And as I started to grow, as I went from white belts through the belts over a course of 11 or so years to earning that provisional black belt and testing at that point in time, I realized, gee whiz, life is like this. And as a matter of fact, fundraising and, and what I specialize in, which is gift planning, is also much like this. We sort of have different phases throughout our life and throughout our careers. And, and I did match the two of those together in a presentation that I've done um, across the country a couple times. And as I was starting to work on that, to answer a question you, you might be thinking or asking, Ted, I realized that all these skills together make up the sum of a whole, as mm -hmm. my karate sensei said when he handed me my, my black belt, Alex, now you're ready to begin learning. And I had to let that sink in for a moment because I wanted to look at him and say, excuse me, the bell. 
<laughs> have I not? You know, have I not arrived? Happened. Right? Have I not arrived? That, that's. But the, but that's an interesting concept. Well, and so so I think um, what I'd like to do with the time that you and I have together, because I I want to make sure that my listeners um, have an opportunity to experience each of the eight pillars of success in the Zen art of fundraising. Um, so uh, I, I gather that the message, perhaps, uh, that, uh, that your sensei was looking for is that it's when you are proficient that you need to learn more. Uh, and it's partly knowing what you don't know, which I think the more knowledgeable you are, the more you know you don't know. Whereas when you're young and you know so little, you think you know so much. Does that make sense? It does, and I bet had I posed the question to the 99-year-old donor yesterday, he would have probably looked at me with a half smile and said, um, you probably know more than I do, Alex. To which I would have responded, no way. But, <laughs> but thank you for your vote of but, but maybe so, it takes 99 yeah, I mean, years to know the truth in that statement, right? That that there's still so much left to to learn so so bring us um bring us to the first pillar uh which uh steve nell shared with us at the top of the show he's still stuck on the first pillar and he's trying to learn how to be in the moment but what does the first pillar mean what does it mean to be in the moment and why is that important to a fundraiser to be able to live and experience the first pillar Sure. So, so I did put this pillar first, and the pillars do build on each other as we go through them. But the reason why this particular one is first, when you start a martial art, for those in the audience who, who meditate, you always need to take a little bit of time to place yourself in the moment and to let all those thoughts and all those things that have happened before this moment or that are going to happen later after this moment to let them quiet down and to focus on the right here and right now. Being in the moment is is terribly important when it comes to your several moments of time with your prospects and your donors. Um, I may not, may or may not be able to sit in the presence of my donor who I who I was with yesterday, so I maximized the 58 minutes I was with him by focusing totally on him and what he was saying. And you can train your mind to do this, and really good fundraisers will be totally immersed in the experience. So that's sort of another way of saying being in the moment, immersed in the experience. Um, often when I listen to a show like this one or I'm, I'm, I'm listening to a webinar at my desk, I'm not really totally in the moment because I'm checking my email and I am doing other things. We need to sometimes put everything else aside and be in the moment. Mm -hmm. And in this multitasking world, especially for fundraisers, with all the things we have on our plates, it's really hard to do that, but it's probably the most important thing you can do. I, I could not agree with you more. And I think one of the reasons why a fundraiser really has to be able to uh, calm him or herself down focus on who is in front of you, the prospect, the person, uh, because that's a learning moment. And if you don't pay attention to everything around that experience, which is not just what the donor is saying, uh, but maybe perhaps how the donor is saying it, uh, the, uh, the environment that you're in, uh, if you're in his or her office or in her home or where they may have chosen to be most comfortable to meet with you, um, there are clues uh, in, in all of that that can make you a better fundraiser. Whereas if you are there only with a series of questions, which is, I'm going to ask you for money, and I'm going to ask you for money for this purpose, and that's all that you can hear and that's all that you can do, then you're not giving the, the, the floor, if you will, you're not giving the space to the donor who, after all, you want the donor to fill that space, not you. But if you've taken up all of the, the room, uh, not being in the moment, not giving that space to the donor, you're going to miss out on very important clues that are going to help you be a good fundraiser. Absolutely, and you might go in with a very narrow purpose down to the 
amount of the ask and what you want to ask for, but when you enter these meetings or you're on the phone, you want to go in with a broad mind. That's right. That's right. Because there's clues. Let, let me give you sort of uh, an example. And it's not because I, I don't want to step all over pillar two, which is listening, because we, we really want to focus on each of these. And as you said, they sort of build on themselves. But this one is being in the moment. And in the moment is about the environment. It's about every aspect of the engagement, right? It's not just the, the audible, the, the listening, um, but it's everything that's around that, that person. I was uh, part of a team that was raising money for um, a national cancer center. Uh, very, very large campaign. And so we needed a lot of money. And we had a donor uh, who certainly was very loyal to the institution. Uh, certainly there was an expectation that this donor would contribute uh, to the, the cancer project. Uh, but th that wasn't his passion. Um, and and in, in talking to him, spending time with him, having several meetings where we didn't make the ask. And I think, quite honestly, he thought we were going to just go ahead and make the ask. Um, but in listening to him, one of the things that I very clearly heard is that, first of all, um, his mother was very influential in his life. His mother had passed, um, and, but, but still had a very prominent place uh, in his life. And her, her passion... Uh, oddly enough, was not cancer research. Um, her passion uh, was music. And what I was able to learn and put together is that what would become passionate for this donor was not necessarily, was not supporting the cancer center, which would have been done out of loyalty and, and respect for the institution, but a larger gift was to be had, a more passionate support was to be had for endowing the music uh, therapy program in his mother's name. And that took being in the moment um, because the picture of the mom led to a, pic a discussion about how important the mother was and the passionate way that that was presented. And it wasn't just about the audible or what was being said or my agenda. It was being in the moment with that donor. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, and that's, and that's a perfect example because it does go into the, the second pillar, but Zen Master Thich Nhat Hanh probably summarized your example very succinctly when he said, the most precious gift we can offer anyone is our attention. Mm -hmm. And you gave that gift. We always think we're getting gifts where we're going after gifts from our donors. We give gifts to our donors too. That's right. And one of those gifts is attention, and it sounds like that's exactly what you gave that person so he felt free to express what he really cared about so that that could come out. In other words, you had a narrow purpose but an open mind. And so you were able to go in there and find this out. And we all know that donors will give more when they give for something that they're passionate about. That's right. So take us from uh, the first pillar. We've sort of teased our audience already that the second pillar is about listening. But help me understand um, that I'm in the moment now. Okay, I've, I've moved beyond the first pillar. Um, but I'm building upon that. As you said, each of these build upon the, the, the prior pillar. So how does listening add to being in the moment? So when we go in with a particular focus, it, it, there have been studies done, and, and I'm not one of those particular experts, but studies done that when we have something in mind and when we're speaking, when we're conveying something or we have that monkey mind that's busy thinking of everything, then we cannot accurately listen. And so by putting yourself in the moment and really focusing your attention, your attention is all those things we spoke about before. It's not just the ears and the eyes, it's, it's sort of everything. You might smell, you might remember a meeting because of a particular smell or because of mm -hmm. something else, you were sitting on a very soft cushion mm -hmm. outside with the breeze flowing on your face. Don't we wish we all had those donor meetings? Mm -hmm. um, but. So listening becomes one of those very important things that we can do once we're in the moment. And it is only through listening that we can connect the donor to our mission and to be able to really focus on the gift. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and one of the, the ways, and, and, and this is a, maybe a little bit more than tongue in cheek that I've I've shared with particularly junior fundraisers uh, who, you know, of course are nervous. They, they know they need to actually make the ask. So they sort of, you know, get the ask out there um, is how you can learn to teach yourself to listen is after you've made the ask, the first one to speak has to make the gift. 
Yeah, that's, that's a pretty good one. <laughs> you know, it, it's probably easier. I, I have the privilege of working with people who tend to be on the older side because I do focus on gift planning. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting how I've been able to learn from, from those donors and prospective donors because their sense of timing and their timing and answering questions. Older people don't have a problem pausing. They don't have to fill every pause with the word um, and they can simply think or they'll say, give me a moment to think about that. And then what you hear is silence. Mm -hmm. And silence can be very refreshing. I think when we're younger, silence is a cause of worry. It's an automatic assumed no. We assume we have to fill the silence. That's right. Fundraisers like you and, and who have been around know sometimes it's better for you not to fill the silence and to wait for your donor to fill the silence. That's right. And, and to control your own nerves. Um, because when you're nervous, some people just feel like they have to talk and have to talk. And so they end up, as I said before, sort of dominating all the air. And, and they're not listening and they're not in the moment and they're not gathering all of those experiences together. And it's only through doing that that you can actually uh, take on what I think is one of the most important roles of a fundraiser, and that is to be the donor's advocate, to help the donor accomplish what they would like to accomplish with their philanthropic dollars, understanding that they don't owe anyone anything, but that they want to make great things happen. Exactly. I, you know, an interesting thing in, in researching, in thinking about listening and, and applying it to fundraising and researching a little bit of quotes. It's interesting. The quote I ended the chapter on listening with, I had to think about for a moment, so I'll share it with everyone. It was a quote shared by Alfred Brendel, and he said, the word listen contains the same letters as the word silent. Hmm. Yeah. A, a, a good way to remember uh, how to uh, to listen is to give that opportunity for silence. I want to move on to the third pillar because we have eight that we want to complete. Um, so the how do we build upon being in the moment and listening uh, with compassion? And what what does compassion have to do with fundraising? So fundraisers will hear an awful lot of stories of things that have driven their donors and prospective donors to make gifts or to consider gifts. Mm -hmm. And we don't always experience, and, and thank goodness, we don't always experience some of the things our donors have gone through. If we've had a house burned down, if we've been abused as a child, if we've needed surgery to repair something, if we had no money and a scholarship enabled us to go to a school and all the myriad of other things that we as fundraisers do. So we sort of have to have a, a switch of compassion that we can kind of turn up as we're sitting across from someone. I've sat across from people in, in smiles, in frowns, in tears, in sobs, in joy, and everything in between. And I'm sure many fundraisers who are listening today have experienced many of the same things. So we need to show compassion to our donors and it is through their compassion and their caring that they're actually willing to make a gift and to support our organizations. Mm -hmm. So compassion is one of those pillars that we as fundraisers need to possess so we can better assist our donors. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a little preview, Ted, of something that's coming in, something else, I'm a project I'm working on now for later this year, but we need to work on all of these things as fundraisers ourselves first in order to be able to find them in others. That's right. So we always think we're going out there to find these things in other people. We need to possess some of these attributes, is the word Steve used, or skills, or pillars ourselves. And that's particularly true with compassion. With compassion. Now, I, I once had a, a woman who is a fundraiser uh, tell me, yes, I know how to fundraise. I'm a good fundraiser. Um, I can take people to lunch. Well, and you know, that didn't make my eight top pillars, even though it's something I do quite regularly. And, and I'm sure we all do. I mean, the ability to converse, the ability just wanting to be with someone else, giving them your time and attention. We talked a little bit about mm -hmm. those things are, are important. But right. look, I'm but is that planner. just taking I, I, had, is that just taking someone to lunch or is it the social aspect of lunch and understanding 
that listening and compassion are 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 actually why you're there and not the meal. Right. I, I, exactly. I was going to reword what you just said, but you said it so eloquently. I was going to say, are you taking them to lunch for you or for the donor? Right. Right. Is it? it I, I took from what she said and knowing that person, which is why I think when I said that, it kind of sat flat for both of us. Um, is that for her, it was transactional. And what you're saying is it's highly emotional. So that takes us to the fourth pillar, which is curiosity. What does curiosity have to do with fundraising? And why is that important? As you said, these are skills or pillars that the fundraisers should be good at, train themselves, test themselves before they make the ask. Why is curiosity on the list? Sure, so curiosity is actually a trait or a pillar of of some of our geniuses in history, across the universe and the history of the world. And so I see no reason why we as fundraisers shouldn't adopt a little bit of this curiosity. The number one thing I believe curiosity boils down to for fundraisers is asking the question, why? Not how much, not when, and not really will you, but what you really want to get to is the why. And so you need some curiosity in you to ask why without just asking how much. Uh So let me give you an example, and and you used an example of of your particular donor earlier and wanting to, you know, how important his mom was to him. You know, I love to ask the question why at all times throughout the relationship. So if someone calls and they're interested in one particular technique, I want to ask them, why are you honing in on that particular technique? And in the end, why are you giving to Northwell? Because we know our donors give to other charities and mm-hmm. and it's not all about Northwell, it's about this particular donor. And if I can be curious and ask why, I can then, while I'm sitting and being in the moment, and figure out what their perceived connection is to Northwell. Not my, not, not my perception, not our brainstorming, not strategic thinking, all of which is an important part of the process, but I can literally go to person one and get the answer to the question why, and then I can run with that answer. Mm-hmm. And curiosity, I think, also is about understanding the values of the other person uh, or persons who you're meeting with, that it's not just about your agenda, your budget, your project, but showing a genuine interest in the human being that is being asked to spend some money, to be philanthropic, and to be curious about, as you said, the why. What's what's behind this? Because, and and not in in sort of a check the box, fill in the, the blank sort of way, but to genuinely, want to know, as I said, as the donor's advocate, um, how can I help you be successful in your philanthropy? And if you're not curious about that, then you can't possibly be successful in that. So So that's true. And it doesn't come down to what our needs are from the charity. They're important, but it's how do you, how does what you want to do help us make you happy and fulfill our needs? It's that match of donor to the mission of the charity that makes that makes us successful. Exactly. One sense. of the things I often share with, with fundraisers is, listen, if your only um, value that you bring uh, to this is that your organization needs money and you're a fundraiser to help bring in that money, well, guess what? Get in line. Because every charity right. needs money. And, and guess what else is true? Once you meet this budget, there'll be another. So the question is, did you beat up your donors just to make a budget? Or did you create a pathway for them to be passionate about your organization and to have a lifetime of giving? Uh, And if you do that, then I think you're really a development officer. You're truly successful as uh, uh, a fundraiser, as a professional, as opposed to just someone who's checking the box. And I think that brings us, doesn't it, to the fifth pillar, uh, humility. Sure. So, you know, humility is one of these that, um, you know, I haven't met too many egotistical fundraisers. I I don't think it's in fundraisers' nature to... 
to be egotistical about what we do. First of all, many people have trouble admitting that that's what they do, that they're a professional fundraiser. Mm -hmm. And there are many of us who are very proud about it, but some kind of hesitate. As I said earlier, hardly any of us my, in my age group or, or older went to school to be a fundraiser. We all just happened into this either through law or through marketing or through just a pure love of the organization that we're with. But, you know, humility is one of those things that, that you need to have at times from a fundraiser, depending on what you do, you'll come across a different variety of people. They don't know anything about you. Many of them actually want to know about you as you get to sit and talk to them over the, the lunch that you mentioned earlier. You know, I'm good at going to lunch and talking to people. But sometimes you need to be able to admit you're wrong or you need to have humility to apologize for something that may have happened or was perceived to have happened in your donor's mind from your organization. And you need to be able to be the one to say, gosh, I'm so sorry. It takes a humble person to look someone in the eye and say, I'm really sorry that happened to you. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about how you feel. Why are you telling me this story? What is it that you need? What can mm -hmm. I do? And then you rely on all the previous pillars that we spoke about. Yeah. Humility is very important. I mean, I, I'm, I'm an attorney. I have advanced degrees. And sometimes I volunteer to go to our events. And I'll sit there and hand people their name tags and show them where the bathroom is. Right, but right. you know what I'm doing? I'm connecting a donor to our mission when I do that. So That's every right. little roll from, we don't have to lick envelopes anymore because they self-seal, but every little point along that access mm -hmm. helps us toward the mission and fulfills the mission mm -hmm. and connects it to our donor. Yeah, I also think of humility uh, as the ability to connect with other human beings on wherever they are, where, you know, to, as, as you said, you know, it's not, do you know who I am and come and meet with me and I'm very important or I represent a very important uh, organization. It's um, understanding that every human being has a story. Um, they have baggage. They bring to you whatever their life experience has been. And can you meet them where they are? Uh, or do you require of them to meet them, uh, meet you where you are? And I think that's the sort of the essence, or at least for me, uh, the essence of, of being humble um, and understanding that every person has a value um, and to meet them uh, where they are and on their terms, uh, I think is, is, is a unique trait that very good fundraisers have as opposed to assuming that you have the, the ability to mold that donor into whatever you want them uh, to be. Um, so Alex, if I can hold it right there, we're gonna take a very, very quick break. Uh, when we uh, come back, I think it's a, it's a good place for us to come back to uh, the sixth pillar being patience. Um, and we will be right back. are always available 24 hours a day at tedhart.com. Click on radio links. If you're listening live today, the phone lines are open. Call in and ask a question by dialing 347-324-3080. Now, back to the Nonprofit Coach with Ted Hart. And we are back here live with Alex Brovey, the uh, author of Zen and the Art of Fundraising, Eight Pillars uh, for Success. And uh, we are uh, up to pillar number six, that is patience. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I have to ask why you need to be patient in fundraising, but tell us how it fits within uh, the Zen and the art of fundraising. Sure. So one, one of the key attributes of people who follow Zen Buddhism and people that we might look at and, and 
spend some time in their presence and feel like, yeah, I really get that good, calm, quiet, zen feeling from them, um, is, is caring. Normally people are very caring when they have that zen attitude or the perception is you can have any conversation with this person. You want to be the type of fundraiser that other people want to continue to meet with, that they want to enjoy speaking with, they feel like they're being listened to. When I actually looked up the definition of each of these pillars, because I wanted to see what Merriam-Webster and other mm -hmm. dictionaries said, one of the definitions of patience that was very interesting was caring, quiet, steady perseverance, even-tempered care. So the traditional definition of why we need to be patient applies, of course. We don't always pick up the phone, call a donor out of the blue, ask for a seven-figure gift, and get a yes. Right. Every once in a while, we have to wait, or it takes a couple more steps mm -hmm. than simply doing that. But the reason why we're patient is because we care. And so we care about this donor, we care about our mission, we care about matching the two, and in order to do that, we need to exhibit the pillar of patience. We don't have that much time left, so I'm not going to get into stories, but gift planners in particular wait an awful long time for gifts from people, some of which don't come until after they pass away. That's right. So it is a very important pillar. Well, and, and I think patience is also uh, sort of divides professionals versus novices in fundraising because uh, most fundraisers right now, if they needed twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars, they probably know who they could call. They have loyal donors. They could get that money, but it doesn't mean that they can just go and get that money. But being patient, taking their time, building the case, uh, building the relationship, showing humility, patience, and and listening and curiosity in who that person is. Um, often will lead to a much larger gift, an estate gift. Uh, but it took that patience to not sort of rush uh, through the gate and grab the check, um, but to to actually know and have the the professional guidance within yourself to say, let's wait, this needs a little bit more time. There are more answers that need to be uh, provided um, that often spells the difference between a truly um, monumental gift and one that was just asked for too quickly. Um, so um, you're right, we're running out of time. Uh, we have about eight minutes left. So help me um, round out the seventh pillar being a sense of humor uh, and the eighth pillar being a mentor. Can you sort of divine those two and then wrap this back up to how do these eight pillars add up to being truly Zen in fundraising? Sure. So, you know, I think one thing we all have in common as human beings, both fundraisers and donors alike, is that we like a good story. And uh, sometimes those stories have humility or they're a little bit self-deprecating. Um, I was sitting with a, a couple, a husband and wife, and both of them happened to have had knee replacements recently. And they said to me, gee, you know, I, I just, you, you can't imagine the pain, or you, you know, you can't imagine what you go through for the first few days. And, but now I'm so grateful I went through it because now we can get back into being ourselves and being healthy. And I was able to look them both in the eye and decided to share a little bit about myself and say, actually, I've had two knee surgeries and I'm on the path to what you went through. So I've hobbled the same path that you have. And we all sort of, we had that thing in common, and we also had sort of, it was, a, it was a humorous moment. Humorous moments can sometimes fill that silence if it becomes uncomfortable or if no one, the donor isn't filling that silence. And it's also a way to let off a little steam. So if things are getting too hot and heavy, if I'm talking about how the, the, the 2018, the, the new tax laws in 2018 will, how it relates to a donor being able to make a five or a 10 or a 15 $15,000 gift and how much they can deduct, you bet at some point I want to soften that a little bit and you and say something humorous in there. Yeah. So I, I think it's I, part of being I, a good fundraiser and reading your donors and keeping the conversation flowing. And, and, and a good icebreaker. You know, and, and humor, I think, makes you a little bit more human. It gives that the, the donor an opportunity to uh, not, uh, not feel that, that uh, they're under the gun or that things, as you said, got too heavy. Um, but because, you know, it is serious business about changing lives uh, and, and having your philanthropic dollars be impactful. Uh, but at the same time, I think giving should be fun. Um, so why would it matter if, we, if we've accomplished all seven pillars? 
I gather we haven't quite gotten our black belt in fundraising yet if we haven't been a mentor. Right, so I, I had to put being a mentor in as the final pillar because when you're a fundraiser and you started out, you had a number of mentors, whether you realized it or not, whether they used a capital M in front of their name, whether you were part of an official program at your organization or an outside organization. So it, the purpose of having knowledge is not to have it, it's to share it. And there is a quote that goes on to say, it is at that point that it becomes wisdom. What is the use of all the knowledge that I've gathered, that you've gathered, that Steve Nill has gathered, that anyone listening has gathered? What is the purpose of all that knowledge if you are not able to share it with someone else? Mm -hmm. It's sort of gone to waste. It's come up against a dead-end street. We don't want to be dead-end streets. We want to keep the knowledge flowing for the benefit of our donors and our organizations and the greater charitable environment. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it's also passing along your expertise and making it possible for sort of next generation of fundraisers um, to not necessarily have to, as you said, learn as you go along and as, as a lot of fundraisers did who didn't study fundraising, that wasn't even uh, possible uh, early on in, in many of our careers. Um, so this is, this is a, a tried and true way that we pass on the skill sets, uh, I suppose, for those who have accomplished many or all of the seven pillars that precede being a mentor. Absolutely. You know, and it, it's one of those signs of success when you can even quietly share whatever knowledge you have. Mm. Look, we, we have this phrase in the fundraising world called best practices. Um, best practices became that way because someone realized what they were, codified them, and then did the last final thing, which is shared them with others. Sure. And that's yes. the definition of mentoring. And that's what makes us all better. Yeah, and as I, as I often say, there's very little in fundraising. It's still all about relationships. It can be digital. It can be on paper. It can be in person. It can be whatever. Uh, but it's still a people-to-people -people business. Uh, it's about relationships and how people connect with each other. And I think you've uh, written a terrific book, and I thank you so much uh, for sharing your expertise and bringing that into this concept of Zen, these eight pillars that I think are just a very thoughtful way uh, for those who want to take fundraising seriously, which means they want to take donors uh, and important works, philanthropic works, seriously. This is a way to organize your mind, this is a way to find some Zen and to be more successful. So, uh, Alex uh, Brovery, before we uh, depart here, can you please make sure that my listeners know how they can reach you? Um, sure. So, probably, I mean, anyone can Google anyone. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook. Um, my email at Northwell is my first initial last name, A-B-R-O-V-E-Y at Northwell. Dot edu. Northwell is in the greater New York metropolitan area. And I would look forward to continuing the discussion through LinkedIn or, or any other way. And thank you very much, Ted, for, for hosting me. It's been my pleasure. Absolutely. Well, you've shared a lot of wisdom with us today. Uh, you clearly have earned your black belt in fundraising. And we appreciate you uh, bringing all that experience into uh, this new book. And, of course, we've posted the link uh, to purchase this book on Amazon at uh, facebook.com forward slash Ted Hart. And that's our show. So, again, Alex Brovey, thank you so much for being our guest here today on The Nonprofit Coach. Thank you, Ted. You've been listening to The Nonprofit Coach Radio Show with Ted Hart. Tell all your friends to check out our production schedule and download our iPod and iPad-friendly podcast at tedhart.com. Thanks for listening to The Nonprofit Coach.